Hey guys, welcome to another episode of True Crimes and Weird Times. I'm Kim. I'm Ashley. And today I'm telling you the story of the trunk murderess, Winnie Ruth Judd. Now this is actually a story that was recommended to me by one of our listeners, and it's a crazy one. It's about a woman who killed two people, and then after she's in custody, she escapes not once, not twice, but seven times. Shut up. (laughs) okay that's gonna be good and i'm gonna be talking about missing children about six hundred thousand people go missing every year in wildlands um national parks even right outside their front door and i'm just gonna cover a few stories of children who have done that way to make it extra creepy ashley you're welcome everyone Both experienced and inexperienced hikers and campers have gone missing under disturbing and mysterious circumstances. Their bodies will be found, if they're found at all, in places that were previously searched, which makes it weird enough. Some will be found with little or no clothing, which can be explained with hypothermia. The last stages are feeling hot and taking off your clothes. And children will be found extremely farther than they originally had Last been seen. Like, up on a mountain where they were at the base of the mountain, miles and miles away from where they were last seen. Uh, And I'm going to talk about two of those today. Like, way further away than it seems like a child should be able to walk on their own? Yeah. Gotcha. Oh, yeah. While I was researching, I was finding statistics that said that a lot of these disappearances happen in the late afternoon and during or just before severe weather makes it harder to find them right yeah so it can seem mysterious anyway Mm -hmm. they're suddenly just gone but they can't find them because they don't have anything to go on right and if it's dark it's hard to search if it's raining and storming Mm -hmm. it's hard to search that makes sense yeah so is it mysterious or did someone just get lost like they do and if these campers and hikers are adults who are going missing, how much easier is it for a child to go missing? Now, the first one I'm going to cover is Dennis Martin, who went missing in 1969. He was a six-year-old boy who was vacationing with his family in the middle of the Great Smoky Mountains at a place called Spencefield. Uh, I read that it is near Cades Cove in Tennessee, so round about Gatlinburg, Pigeon Forge. Which I'm super familiar with, actually. We took so many family vacations there growing up. Right. Which actually makes it a little bit creepier for me. Yeah. But if you've been around Cades Cove, it's notorious for bears, uh, other wildlife, but mostly bears. They're they're actually, if you drive around, there's signs saying, Oh, yeah. Watch for bears. (laughs) It's not uncommon to see black bears out there. Right. Yeah. Now, while Dennis's parents were talking to another adult, Dennis, his brother, and two other older boys decided it would be a funny prank to go hide behind some bushes and scare their parents, as kids do. Now, right. this they're not going a long way. It's like bushes. They're just jumping out to scare their family. So they're not running off. They're not running off into the woods. They're just right. hiding kind of over here. Yeah. Now, three of the boys went one way, and Dennis went the opposite way, circling around to get behind the bush. When they go to jump out, only three boys come out. Dennis is nowhere to be found. And this is all within, I'm sure, just a few minutes. However long it takes to go, hey, let's do a prank. and Let's hide behind these bushes. Let's hide behind these bushes. Uh, and that, that was the last time anyone ever saw him. How old was he? Six. And they were just going around some bushes. They weren't, like, wandering far off. Yeah, that's how it read. They were just they just ran behind some bushes to jump out at their parents and then he's gone. Wow. Nowhere to be found. Now, 6 miles away, uh a young boy who was scared out of his mind said that he saw not Dennis, by the way. <laughs> said that he saw what he first thought was a bear. Like I said, around Cades Cove, around the area is normal. Right, yeah, there's bears. 
But then to him, it looked like it was actually a large man who was carrying something or someone over his shoulder. Oh, no. So did somebody snatch him? But that's six miles away. At the same time or later on? That I couldn't find, but I'm assuming it was later on. Okay. Because they they questioned if that was perhaps Dennis that the little boy saw but on the guy's shoulder. Now, the search party started right away looking for this little boy. And they worked through the night. But then a storm came through. Of course. Yeah, it washed away evidence. The, do- the dogs couldn't find any sense to find him. But here's the weird thing. The FBI, the Green Beret, police, and some other agencies actually all kind of got in on this. They were searching for this little boy, which is odd. Um, normally, they don't have a ton of agencies out there looking for a kid. Right. You know, they just pick one to go out and search. It's usually the police department. Right. So, okay. So it was kind of strange there, but... I mean, if they're looking for this little boy, who cares who comes in? Just help me find him. Right, yeah. I'd want all the help I could get. Yeah. And they all searched for clues or pieces of evidence, but they could never find anything. No footprints, no articles of clothing, nothing. I wonder why he didn't call out for anybody. I don't know. If somebody snatched him, I, I assume they could cover his mouth. But still, if they're just behind a bush, wouldn't they have heard even something muffled? Or some kind of struggle. Or some kind of struggle, yeah. Or just somebody walking away. Yeah. It's crazy enough that a child would go missing that quickly. You know, just hiding behind a bush. Yeah. But it's also said that the leader of the FBI group who organized the search committed suicide and nobody knows why. So, of course, that's going to start the rumor mill anyway. Also, another Special Forces agent, Harold Cleveland, issued a statement in 2014 now, this is years after this happened. He went missing in 1969. Oh, wow. Yeah. Now, he issued the statement to News of the Weird. So, I don't know how credible this is. Not to slam the website, but I just don't know. Right. I don't know the credibility. Yeah. But he's quoted as saying, Our special forces are never called to assist in civilian operations. That falls to the local National Guard and approved by the state governor. The fact that they were armed as well is another huge no-no. During my command and every other mission I was aware of, we were not allowed by federal protocol to do either. Something is very wrong with this missing kid scenario. I've done some research on this case, both while on active duty and after my retirement. The inside facts of this case depict a frightening investigation. Bottom line is that searching started within a few minutes of the boy's disappearance and lasted three months with every resource imaginable being deployed. Don't even start with the terrain was difficult, holes and caves and cliffs and creeks, etc. Our special troops can find almost anything, anytime, and in any terrain. We have the highest technology available worldwide and easily the best training in real-world wartime and mission-specific experience that the normal civilian populace can scarcely imagine. After studying this case, the fact that no trace of the boy was ever found is mind-boggling. The Green Berets that were tasked in the search were there for a specific reason— They were armed for a specific reason. I can't and won't say why because my oath documents won't allow it, but I will remind you of these facts. Nationwide, there have only been four occasions where the special forces were brought in on a civilian missing persons case. Two of these involved a possible armed perpetrator. The other two were this case and another similar to it about three years later and regionally nearby. This is out of thousands of missing cases since the early 60s when our special troops were born. So, weird... Very oh. weird. <laughs> that can't be. Again. Yeah, that can't be the only kid that went missing in the woods. So right. why would this one warrant the Green Berets? Yeah, when the rest of them didn't. What if they're just looking for somebody? But what if it's something more paranormal? Could be Bigfoot. <laughs> it's Bigfoot, probably. <laughs> Man, I could speculate for hours on what happened. I know, but I won't. I don't know. I will. That's what I'm here for. (laughs) I won't make you listen to it, I guess. (laughs) My next story is about Catherine Van Alst, who went missing in 1946. She was eight years old when she was camping with her family at Devil's Den State Park. First of all, never go anywhere named Devil anything. Right. Why would you do that? Where do you want to go on our nice family vacation? How about Devil's Den? (laughs) 
no devil's den, no devil's nest, no devil anything. Because why do you think they named it that? Funsies? But anyway. Oh, and devil's den is in Arkansas. I forget to mention. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so she was playing with her brothers when she wandered away and got lost. Uh, according to a newspaper article, which I can actually throw into our social media accounts. Okay. So you can see it. Uh, it also shows a picture of her because they did find her. But according to the newspaper article, they were actually returning f- to their park cabin from a creek. So they had been swimming. So she goes missing. She's missing for six days, almost a week. This is just returning to their cabin. Like, she just, she's just gone. Were they walking with her? Like, did she I wander off? I think she was off? just kind of lagging behind. And then and she, she was just gone. wandered off. Yeah. She just got turned around. That would have been me as a kid. Me too. But this would be me now. And my mom likes to talk about how if she would send me next door to my grandmother's house, I would stop here to look at flowers. And then I'd wander over there to look at trees. And I'd wander over across the yard. And it would take me 10 minutes just to walk across the yard. That's my kids. I can understand how frustrating that would be. (laughs) That was me. I was that kid. I totally do that now. But that's because I use landmarks. Oh. Rather than know what street names are. Because why would you do that? (laughs) Okay, anyway, she's missing for six days, guys. She's just in a bathing suit. She's barefooted, which when they found her showed no harm done to her feet, which is bizarre in just a minute because she was found in a cave 20 to 30 miles away from where she was last seen. Was she alive? She was alive. They found her alive. Yes, she survived. They found her 20 to 30 miles away from where she was, where she was originally. And when she walked out, they said that she was kind of eerily calm. She was a little dazed, but very calm and just said, here I am. What? Yeah. Like, hey guys, what's up? According to David Pilatus, which let me tell you a little bit about David Pilatus. I have so many questions. (laughs) Now, and I'm only throwing this in here so that you kind of get a feel. He wrote the book called Missing 411. There are two documentaries about it. Uh, The first one is definitely on Amazon. I watched it not too long ago. There's several books. He writes kind of -of matter-of-factly, like it's just facts about each missing person. But the reason I laugh is because he was a retired detective who turned cryptozoologist, studied Bigfoot. (laughs) As one does? Well, yeah. Wrote several books about Bigfoot. But while he's researching... He's researching national parks and he starts noticing a lot of people go missing in national parks. I think his take on it is, is something very strange going on. I don't know if he ties Bigfoot into all of that eventually, but it's more of a, it's very strange this many people are disappearing and no one's talking about it kind of thing. Well, I mean, people get lost in the woods. It's not like a big yeah. conspiracy thing. Well, have you ever seen the picture of all the cave systems and then all the missing people? It's kind of... I have not. The same. I will link that in the social media. Good idea. Just a little backstory on David Pilatus because a lot of these are actually mentioned in his missing 411 books. Sounds like a book I need to get. Yeah. I want to read it, but I definitely watched the documentary and it's it's wild. So according to David Pilatus, <laughs> I'm digressing a lot. Sorry. Catherine only remembered sleeping in a warm, grassy field the first night. Didn't remember anything else after that, except that she found the cave she was in high up in the mountains. She ate berries and drank from pools of water. That's how she survived. Oh, my God. When they found her, and it actually, the picture they show in that newspaper article I found, she's like super skinny. This is just six oh, days. Yeah. yeah. But that's all she had to eat and drink. It's she, amazing that she found those things. Yeah. Like, props to her for surviving in that but like i said they found her she's safe but that's the end of that story but it's just really weird did <sighs> that she doesn't remember anything else her feet were fine her feet were fine but 20- she was barefooted yeah she's barefooted and she had a bathing suit on she survived for six days in a bathing suit that's crazy and she's she walked 20 to 30 miles away Okay, so lesson here is the first thing I'm going to teach my child is that if you get lost, don't go anywhere. Don't move. Stay where you are. Good luck telling a kid that. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Especially mine. Now, the next story I have is Keith Parkins, and he went missing in 1952. This one is actually in the Missing 411 documentary. 
I really like the story. It's crazy. Now, on April 10th, Keith Parkins was playing with his brothers at his grandparents' cattle ranch. Now, this cattle ranch is ginormous. It's just out in the middle of farmland. So it's just a lot of acreage. A farm. A farm, <laughs> if you will. Now, they had gone out to see a new calf that had been born. Uh, and Most calves are born. That's rude. <laughs> <laughs> well, this calf was specifically born. <laughs> It was the most born. <laughs> <laughs> Their mom, Edna, had called them in for lunch. And his brothers ran in, left Keith behind. <laughs> He's two years old. But now, what? this is at home. So I can kind of, but still, <laughs> how do you run off and leave your two-year-old brother out there? That's a toddler. My son is two years old. And I wouldn't leave him outside for any would, period of I time. I wouldn't have let him go outside by himself anyway. Yeah. This area was like still had snow. It was cold. But I'm not here to slam a parent. But That's also it was what? The 60s? Yeah, it was 52. 50, so, I mean. That's pretty normal. Yeah. Go outside, kids. Get out of my hair. <laughs> Get out of here. Uh, so, Keith stayed behind. He was playing around the barn on the property. Edna asked, hey, you know, where's Keith? And they're like, oh, he's. But he went behind the barn to play. So, she goes up there to try to find him. But he was nowhere to be found. Now, I don't know the time frame in which all of this happened. Again, I'm just assuming it's, hey, kids, lunch is ready. They run in. You know, she turned around, putting stuff on the table, and then like, oh, hey, where's Keith? Oh, he's outside by the barn. So yeah, she goes up there. So not a not, lot of time. It's not super concerning yet, either. Right. It's just like, oh, okay, I'll go up there and get him. Mm -hmm. Like, it doesn't seem like a huge time frame. But she can't find him. He's gone. So, of course, immediately she calls the police. They begin a search. They started within speaking distance of each other, the people in the search, and then they spread out. So they're at the home, and then they go outwards. They just fan. Yeah. Eventually, there were about 200 people helping in the search. They went throughout the night into the next morning and really couldn't find anything. The only thing they could find was about three miles out, there were footprints that walked through a herd of cattle. So he had walked through there, and then after that, they didn't find any other evidence. Now, this is already three miles out. But this is where he lives, right? This is no, his, his grandparents' home. house. Oh, They're okay. visiting grandparents. So he's not as familiar with the area. Right. Now, at 7 a.m. the next morning, a searcher found the body of the two-year-old. He was face down in the snow. His hat and his coat was next to the body. Oh. Then they realized he's still alive. <gasps> yeah. Uh, now, his body was stiff from the cold. He couldn't move. I mean, he's cold. Yeah. It's snowy. He had some scratches on his face. His clothes were ripped. His mother says that it looks like he had maybe tried to crawl through some barbed wire. Maybe mm. some briars, you know. And he was flown to a nearby hospital, made a full recovery. Now, he goes missing at around 12 p.m. lunchtime. Mm-hmm. He's found at 7 a.m. the next day. That's 19 hours that he's been missing. Wow. And he just, I assume, walks 12 miles from where he was last seen at night. Wow. Now, the documentary, they actually interview Keith. He's an older man now. He still had the clothes from that day. Like, his mom saved them, and he kept them. That's a little weird. It is, well, I figure it's kind of a big... Yeah, um, I mean... It's a big event in yeah. one's life. But it was just cute because it was so small. <laughs> But this is from the time we lost you and you almost died. <laughs> this is the time I wasn't watching you and you ran away. <laughs> but he says he can't remember anything from that day. But he was two. Oh, uh, yeah. How much do you remember? But it's just odd that he survived something like that, really. In the snow, he's two years old, 12 miles. Like That is so far for kids a kid. Kids get away, but 12 miles? That's far for me. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, you're lucky if you see me walk a mile. Yeah. Now, this last one, the name of the child wasn't given. There's actually an interview with Coast to Coast AM, which was my favorite ever growing up. I love listening to that like two in the morning and it would freak me out. I couldn't go to bed. Never listen to really? it. Really? It's, it's an old radio show and they do interviews and they talk about weird things and aliens, UFOs, et cetera, et cetera, whatever. Oh, the original podcast? The original <laughs> podcast. Now, this little boy, John Doe, we'll call him John. He went missing in 2010. Oh, that's not that long ago. No. He was three years old. Uh, he went missing, but don't worry, he was also found. Uh, Thank you for letting me know ahead of time. Yeah. 
I've been. I like. I wanted to leave the last one in there, but then I've been really worried. Yeah. <laughs> During a trip near Mount Shasta, 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 Shasta. Sh- oh God, know. guys, please don't yell at me. It's in California. <laughs> He was last seen at a fly fishing river. Uh, I don't know what he was doing. Maybe he was swimming. Maybe he was fishing. Oh, yeah. He was three. I'm, maybe he was just hanging out with his family. But then he just vanishes for five hours. He was found dazed but unharmed. And he was found in a grove of trees. Now, when they ask him, hey, what happened? He kind of told him a weird story. He told the investigators that he had followed a woman who looked a lot like his grandma. He thought it was his grandma. To a mountain and then to an underground room. He said that he saw some motionless robots and weapons that were on the dirt floor. He actually said that he believed that the woman who he thought was was his grandma. He said he thought his grandma was a robot. Then he mentioned seeing a strange glow that came from the woman's head. The woman asked him... (laughs) To defecate on a piece of paper. What? Yeah. And, of course, he said no. And that seemed to make her upset. She was aggressive. And she then told him that he was from outer space. He had been implanted in his mother's womb. And then she would just said, hey, why don't you go out there and just wait in the trees till you're found? Okay. Yeah. Which I guess that's what he did because then he was found in the trees. Now, <laughs> this seems like... Maybe an overact of imagination. Seems well, a little detailed. I for- keep I keep thinking. So, like, my son's almost three. Yeah. And just yesterday, he hurt his foot, and he wanted to call my mom and tell his <laughs> nana that he was hurt. And he started into this story about nana. My foot's hurt and it's bleeding because I stepped on my fire truck. <laughs> when in reality, he jumped off of his slide. <laughs> And landed on it funny, and it just hurt a little bit. There was no yeah. fire truck. There was no blood. Yeah. Like, he just made up this totally different story. Right. Well, and my three, almost four-year-old does the same thing. But here's the thing. She's never told me about robots. Or asking to poop on a paper. Poop on a paper. That is a very detailed story. Yeah, it story. seems a little extra detailed for a three-year-old. But the strange part is... That his actual grandmother, not the robot lady who pretended to be his grandmother, (sighs) she went camping with the family during this trip. She claims that she was dragged from her tent, and when she woke up the next morning, she had a pain in the base of her neck where she found two small holes in the back of her head. Now, in a lot of UFO sighting, abduction stories, that's something people claim. Wait, she was drugged from her tent? But went back to sleep? Here's the thing. In a lot of abduction stories, there is missing Tom. So maybe she was dragged away. She had her lost Tom slash abduction. And then she wakes up with a chip implanted in her. What are you? Whatever aliens do. So it sounds like an abduction story to me. True or not. Right. That's crazy. So what happened to John Doe? Or what were they trying to do? Did he have missing time that he doesn't realize? I don't... It's hard to know with a three-year-old. Yeah. But I would assume if some lady's asking him to poop on a piece of paper, (laughs) there's not much missing time in between that. But see, also, that kind of sounds like exactly like something my child would come up with. Yeah, it does. Like, my child who likes to moon people and talk about buttholes. Yeah. So Well, and, yeah. She wanted me to poop on paper, Mommy. Like, that sounds exactly like <laughs> something he say, would come up with. I was going to would say it and giggle. They, they love poop jokes. Yeah. And it drives me nuts. <laughs> Winnie Ruth McKinnell, who went by Ruth was born January 29th, 1905 in Oxford, Indiana, to Reverend H.J. McKinnell and his wife, Carrie McKinnell. At 17 years old, she married Dr. William C. Judd, who was actually 22 years older than her. He was a World War I vet, and he had a drug habit. Cool. He had apparently been injured during the war and got addicted to morphine. Okay, that makes sense. So it was an ongoing problem after that. And they met at a hospital they were both working in. Ruth was doing some desk work and filing and, 
You know, he was a charming, impressive, smooth talking doctor. <laughs> yeah. He had to be to catch somebody 22 years younger than him. Like yeah. a 17 year old is going yeah. for this guy. So after they get married, Ruth and William move around a lot because with his drug addiction, uh, he has trouble holding a job. Yeah. And so they end up hopping around here. They're in Mexico and California and just all over the oh, United wow. States. And they just move all the time. Now, over the next seven years after they get married, Ruth has several medical issues. She has trouble getting pregnant. And then she actually suffers a couple of miscarriages along oh. with that. And then eventually she is diagnosed with tuberculosis. Oh, good thing she's married to a doctor. Well. Oh, okay. <laughs> After her diagnosis, Ruth decides to move to Phoenix, Arizona, because apparently Phoenix is known for their tuberculosis rehab. The The air is really dry. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, it's yeah. supposed to be easier for them to breathe. And now this is in 1930. She's been married to her husband for seven years, and she decides to go by herself. Huh. Okay. So she's going to move to Arizona, and William is going to stay in Mexico, which is where he was at the time. Okay. They do keep in contact, though. I mean, they're not just separating and ending the marriage. Yeah. They write letters and they talk and oh, okay. stuff okay. like that. Okay. Now, once she gets to Arizona, she found a job there working as a governess to a very wealthy family. And while working here, she meets Happy Jack Halloran. Halloran? What a, what a Halloran. name. Halloran? Halloran. Halloran. It's probably Halloran. <laughs> <laughs> Should have looked that up first. I'm sorry, guys. Yeah. It's a weird name. Well, his name was Jack Halloran, but his nickname was Happy Jack. That sounds like a ser serial killer name. I'm sorry. Well, yeah, kind of. Gave it away, folks. <laughs> sorry. He <laughs> was a very successful 44-year-old businessman. He worked in the lumber industry. And he had, you know, friends in high places, political circles, stuff like that. Oh, nice. Uh, he was also married. Oh, nice. But he had a reputation for sleeping around, being mm -hmm. a player. Oh, mm. Jack. So Ruth is now 25 years old, and she's been married to a drug addict for seven years. She's moved across the country by herself. She's got tuberculosis. And here's this charming, friendly, flirty man showing her attention. Well, so. I get it. Naturally, the two start an affair. Yeah. After a few months at this job, Ruth gets a new job as a secretary at a local clinic. And this is where she meets 32-year-old Agnes Ann Leroy, who is working as an x-ray technician. And she also meets Agnes's 24-year-old roommate, Hedvig Samuelson. I like Hedvig. That's Hedvig such a cool is name. a great name. <laughs> The two women had moved to Phoenix together from Alaska after Hedvig had contracted tuberculosis. Okay. So they had something to bond over. Right. Yeah. The three women quickly become friends and eventually they invite Ruth to move in with them as a third roommate. She does, but as so many friends find out, living together <laughs> is not quite the same as just being friends and hanging out sometimes. So eventually they get into some arguments. There's some clashing of personalities. Apparently mm -hmm. the two women are very neat and tidy and Ruth is very not oh, neat and tidy. Oh, that should do it. Stuff like that. Okay. So she only lives with them a couple of months and then she moves back out into her own apartment. But they do continue hanging out. It doesn't ruin the friendship. They just oh, okay. can't live together. Yeah. Fair enough. But it's not long before something else ruins the friendship. Oh, Ruth. You see, Ruth's boyfriend, Happy Jack. Happy Jack. <laughs> is also friends with Hedvig and Agnes. And he's a little too friendly for Ruth's oh, liking. Oh, yeah. He has that reputation. So tension starts building between the three women. <laughs> and on October 18th, 1931, Ruth's brother drops her off at the train station so that she can catch a train to Los Angeles, which is where her husband William is currently living. Like to visit him, I'm assuming, or go back to live with him? Well, we don't know for sure what her plan is at this point. Okay. So she had checked two big trunks into baggage before boarding the train. That's a lot of stuff. Now these trunks immediately draw suspicion 
from their foul odor oh. and what appears to be blood leaking out of them. Oh, no. No, 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 no. The trunks are flagged for inspection upon arrival. What did she think that was going to happen? <laughs> <laughs> you know. And when the train arrives in California, Ruth is asked for the key to the trunks. She says, oh, I don't have it. I left it in my brother's car. I can't help you open them. Now, somehow, after they ask her for the key, yeah, she takes off. So oh. I, I don't know why the police, like you have trunks that smell bad and there's blood leaking from them. Yeah, that should have been a giveaway. They don't like keep her. Now, I did read one article that said the police suspected it was smuggled deer meat. What? And, <laughs> so you got to think this is the Great Depression. Yeah, I know, but... <laughs> Right. Maybe and, it's all the true crime podcast, but that's not my first thought. Right. <laughs> so apparently it was it was kind of common for this to happen, for people to try and smuggle deer meat okay. places. Okay. So maybe they were just like, oh, she's smuggling some stuff she shouldn't have. It's just meat. It'll be fine. Yeah, totes fine. So somehow she's not arrested and she just... Well, she books it. Yeah, she gets out as quickly as possible. <laughs> what too? Because it ain't dear me, I bet you. <laughs> well, the police finally get the trunks open, and she is long gone. Ugh. In the first trunk, they find the head, torso, and lower legs of Hedvig Samuelson. Oh, sweet Hedvig. They later find her upper legs in a left-behind valise, which is just a small suitcase, but everyone was very specific on calling it a valise, so... Okay. You know, in a suitcase. Well, her legs didn't fit, I guess. All right. Yeah, they didn't fit. They couldn't fit her entire Ooh. body in this trunk, so they dismembered her. Because she got some thick songs. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Hedvig. And the other trunk contained the still intact body of Agnes Ann Leroy. What, like she just folded her up and threw her in? Yep. Oh, no. No, 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 no. They didn't have to cut her up. They just, she fit. All right. Mm, cool. Just two days earlier, on Friday, October 16th, 1931, Ruth had gone to have dinner with Agnes and Hedvig. Now, she's not there too long before an argument breaks out among the women. It's generally believed that it was over Happy Jack. Yeah, okay. Now, the, the details are kind of mixed on depending on what source you go by because this is from the 30s. Yeah. There's not a lot of reliable information right. from this case. Ruth claims that she killed the women in self-defense. They were threatening her with a gun. She was in the kitchen and one of the women came up at her with the gun. She tries to grab a knife, somehow ends up with her own gun or gets the gun away from her. The details are just very okay. foggy. But... She does get shot in the hand. Ruth is shot in her left hand. She is shot by whom? See, in her that's left the hand. thing. Uh, so she's shot in her left hand, and then she gets the gun from the women, whichever one has it, uh -huh. and she shoots both of them. Okay. After the women died, Ruth stuffs Agnes into a trunk, and when Hedvig won't fit in the other trunk, she cuts her up. Uh, yeah. To mm -hmm. make her fit. Yep, get it, got it, okay. Now, prosecutors in the case insist that she had an accomplice. And eventually they arrest Happy Jack and they charge him as an accomplice. However, eventually he's completely exonerated and released. Man, get everything. But, you know, personally, I totally think he was the one to come and help her because... Oh. Dismembering and loading dead bodies is a lot of work, and Ruth is a very small lady. Okay. I cannot imagine she did that on her own. But why would he? He's just flirting with them, right? Like, uh, well, it's a little unclear. It seems as though he was just kind of flirting, talking to them. Right. But the women were also like after him. They they were not just. Huh being flirted with they were actively flirting back with yeah. him so it was a really teenage-esque yeah. love triangle yeah, no kidding. but like i said ruth claims it was self-defense mm -hmm. they were arguing about him the women came at her with a gun shot at her 
if she killed them in self-defense. Okay. However, if I kill someone in self-defense, I feel like I wouldn't then dismember the bodies and stuff them in a trunk. No, probably not, but I've never been in that situation. I mean, yeah, but why take them home, too? Why would you put them on the train with you? I don't know. I I'll, wouldn't touch it again. I'll take these bodies home. I'll figure it out from there. <laughs> hey, husband. <laughs> right. Yeesh. So I had an affair. I killed these women, and can you help with this, or yeah. what? How's this going to work? Either way. So after she kills them, she gets them stuffed into trunks, and I don't know what she does for the entire next day between killing them on Friday and boarding the train on Sunday. Oh. But I can't imagine it was a good day. Mm. I don't know if she spends the whole day dismembering them and putting them in the trunk, because it was late at night Friday when she yeah. kills them. I don't know if she brings multiple people in to help her. I don't know if she brings just Happy Jack in mm. to help her. I, I don't know. But she kills them Friday night. Sunday is when she boards the train home, and they find the bodies. Yeah. After the bodies were discovered, police start searching for Ruth because, you know, she ran away. She ran away and there's two bodies in these trunks. Because they thought it was deer meat. <laughs> but she was arrested just four days later. She didn't escape for very long. Oh, okay. They caught her pretty quickly. Now, the police go to search the home where the women were killed. Uh -huh. And I found a few reports that, in my opinion, were a little less reliable than okay. some of my other sources. So I don't know how much credit I'll put to this. Supposedly, the police decided that Ruth had come in while they were sleeping and shot each woman in the head while they were asleep. Huh. But, mm. like, the mattresses were missing from the home. Oh, okay. And there was lack of blood in other places and stuff. But like I said, that source was not something that I would take as gospel. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. yeah. I, get I don't know how true that is. But I do know, after the police searched the home, the homeowner, I guess they were renting the house. Okay, yeah. The homeowner starts selling 10-cent tickets for people to come tour the murder home. What? Well, no, no, that's about right for the 30s. Right, because remember in our last case, they let people come and look at the slaves. Yeah. So, like, this is a common theme, I guess, for people. Well, yeah, you gotta sell, you gotta get some money somehow. Oh, there's no internet. I guess you got to do something. That was the depression. You literally have to make that bread. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, immediately, like the police come search the house. And like the next day, the homeowner's like, tickets, oh my come God. see the murder house. <laughs> like they didn't clean it. Nothing. And oh. thousands of people came to tour the house. I'm sure house. they did. Thousands. Y'all need some waffle. Two years after her arrest, Winnie Ruth Judd, now commonly referred to as the Trunk Murderess. I kind of like it. It's not a bad name. It's not a bad one. She's tried and convicted of the murder of Agnes Leroy. And only Agnes Leroy. Huh. Now, I couldn't find any particular reason why they only charged her with the one murder. Personally, I suspect that it was because... That meant they didn't have to talk about the dismemberment of Hedvig. But wouldn't that give her a bigger sentence? That could cast doubt on whether she actually killed them. <gasps> because how would this small woman dismember this body all by herself? Yeah. So if they just leave it. that case, like that murder out, it's a much more surefire conviction. Yeah. I feel like. No. I could be totally wrong. No, I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> I picture Chicago right now. That makes sense. So... And then, like I said, Happy Jack was sent to, like, his pretrial hearing. Yeah. And that's when they dropped all the charges. And they actually brought Ruth in to testify. Mm -hmm. And she straight up tells him, yeah, I killed them in self-defense. And he cut them up and put them in trunks for me. Oh. And, yeah. But the jury's like, nah, they're fine. He's fine. <laughs> Their actual logic was that the prosecution's story changed so much and so often about what actually happened when it comes to Ruth mm -hmm. that they could not reliably charge him with this because the the prosecution didn't even know what they were charging Ruth with half the time. Yeah. They can't so trust her word. They can't say that the police's narrative is right this time when they've changed it so many times. Yep. yep. That makes sense. So that's why he's released. So after the trial, Ruth is sentenced to death by hanging because that Ooh, was still a thing in the yeah. 30s. However, 
just a few days before she's scheduled to be hanged, Ruth was put through a sanity hearing. Her defense in the trial was insanity. What? And she is declared insane. See, they don't even use her self-defense argument yeah. in trial. They just say she's crazy. Come on, Ruthie. <laughs> but she is declared insane. She's sent to the Arizona State Asylum, which was the only one in the state at the time. Oh, my God. Anyway. Now, this, <laughs> this is not the end of the story. Really? Between 1933 and 1936, Ruth escaped from the hospital <gasps> six what? times. <laughs> now, it's usually not for very long. I found, like, the detailed mm -hmm. each escape, what she did. But, I mean... A couple of them, she comes back on her own. I mean, she <laughs> she goes out for a little while and she comes back. Oh, okay. Um, but in one instance, she makes it all the way to Yuma, Arizona, before she's caught, and that's oh, that's almost two hundred yeah. miles away. And she's caught and brought back. And there's one time she escapes right before Christmas for a couple of days and comes back. Well, yeah, it's Christmas. How dare they? Kill right. Her. <laughs> Then in October of 1963, she escapes for her seventh and final oh. time. This what? That's like 30 years later. So how old is she? At this point, she's 58 years old. <laughs> Which is not that old, but still. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And she makes her way to California. She takes on the name Marion Lane. Mm -hmm. And she even gets a job as a live-in maid for this super rich family in San Francisco. Holy cow. Okay. However, after six and a half years living <laughs> life as Marion Lane, she's discovered. They figure out who she is, and they take her back to the asylum. That shouldn't have even been a thing. They should have just sent her to jail and been done with it. Well, Ruth later claims that she escaped so many times uh -huh. because she had befriended a nurse who had given her a key <laughs> and she kept it hidden near one of the doors. Like she didn't keep it on her. She hid yeah. it near a door so she could just be like, I think I'll leave today. Uh, it looks like I need to go out to dinner. Right. And now that was for the three year span when yeah. she escaped six times. I don't know. I don't know if that's how she got out again in 63. Like you said, that's 30, 30 years yeah. later. So, Maybe she I had guess. a key still. Holy cow. But I also read several reports that she was not a typical patient. She was very aware. She was very not insane. Yeah, because she wasn't insane. <laughs> and she would help with the other patients. She'd help give them baths. She'd do crafting <laughs> and like classes. She was working. At she was all. basically a nurse there. Oh, my God. Which is probably how she befriended yeah. one. And got a key. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So she's sent back to the asylum. And when she gets back, she's just like, look, I got to get out of here. And she hires some like big shot lawyers. Uh -huh. And it's a lot of details about appeals and this and that and that. But basically, uh -huh. in December of 1971, Ruth is released from her mental institute and declared mentally sound. Oh, <laughs> Because she was rehabilitated or she was never crazy? I don't know the answer. <laughs> I assume because she was never crazy. Yeah, me too. But she actually then returns to California and goes back to work for the rich family <laughs> she was working for <laughs> took her back. when she was on the run. Yeah, so she comes back and she's like, hey, guys, remember me, Marion Lane? Actually, my name is Ruth. I'm a murderer. Can I have my job back? Yeah, you were great. We'd love to have you back. At, yeah, they did. They were like, okay, yeah, sure. Come on back. We like you. Oh, okay, okay, okay. She maintained that it was all in self-defense until the day she died, which was October 23rd, <gasps> 1998. Oh, just like yesterday. And she was 93 years old. Wow. What a loss. I know. And can you, so I guess my biggest question on this case, do you think she murdered them in cold blood or do you think it was really self-defense? Maybe, um, maybe I have just listened to too many true crime podcast documentaries. I think she just killed them. 
See, I kind of lean towards self-defense. Really? Personally. Because she didn't have a violent past that I could tell. I mean, we don't have a lot of information <laughs> on her childhood and everything, but... I mean, if she never she never does it again, she never has any more violent tendencies. Yeah, she was yeah. so helpful at the mental institute, like helping take care of people. This Maybe. family hires her back to be their live-in maid slash caregiver for their elderly mother. Yeah, I mean, I I get it, I get it. Also, this guy she was seeing, the Happy Jack. I mean, maybe he was just like a super manipulative terrible person oh, heck maybe he did it and she's covering up for him exactly well no she definitely didn't cover up for him well she, at that she hearing made it less well yeah you're right that hearing she actually there's a quote we can put it on the facebook from her that's basically like i'm about to be hanged for this man's actions like yeah. i killed them in self-defense it's his fault that we put them in trunks and cut them up and tried to hide them so i kind of believe her I kind of believe that she went over there, an argument started, maybe one of the women got upset, and she shot them in self-defense. Yeah, okay. But, you know, don't dismember their bodies and put them in trunks and try to leave the state and after that. And take them home with you. Yeah. Like, what was her plan when she got there? Honey, I'm home. We gotta get rid of this. Yeah. <laughs> and then to escape six times... Seven times total. Well, that's the part that makes me wonder if she was just guilty. But maybe it was, I don't want to be here. I shouldn't even be here. Right, I yeah. can see it both ways. Mm-hmm. Like, well, I got this key. I guess I could leave for a little while. Like, maybe she would go. <laughs> I'll be right back. I'll be back, guys. I just want to go dancing. I just want to go dance. Thanks for listening. Like us on Facebook at True Crimes and Weird Times Podcast. Follow us on Instagram at True Crimes Weird Times. Email us your stories at True Crimes Weird Times at gmail.com. And if you enjoyed the show, make sure to subscribe and leave a review. Bye.